At 22 hours on March 9th, three blasts of the siren were followed by the announcement on the loudspeaker, aka 330. Stand by. All the pilots leapt up and dived into their flying suits. We trainees had not yet begun our firing practice on the Kai-43, so we could only go out in the squadron's Kai-27. An hour later, a single blast on the siren. The loudspeaker spoke at once. Take cover in the air raid shelters. Bitterly disappointed, we ran to the shelters. A heavy and threatening silence seemed to reign over the landscape. Towards one o'clock in the morning, a deep, rosy colour tinged the sky to the southeast. The B-29s must have started bombing the capital. According to information from the commander of 136, the defensive zone of Kanto, 334 planes had flown over at an altitude of 6,000 feet. At last, losing patience, one of the pilots spoke to our commanding officer in the darkness. Excuse me, sir, we would like your permission to make a sortie. It is time we took off. No, replied the CO sternly. I am just as frustrated as you are, but we have no orders. The 53rd Squadron, based at Matsudo, is responsible for destroying the bombers. Control yourselves. Were the buildings of the Imperial University of Tokyo, my university, on fire? We waited impatiently for news of the destruction of the superfortresses. I could see again those giant craft that I had seen for the first time over Kyushu. Amongst them must be those I had allowed to escape. One o'clock, two o'clock. The time trickled away slowly. At last, at 4.30 hours, the all-clear sounded. The B-29 raid has lasted for nearly three hours. Enraged at our enforced inaction, we went back to bed sullenly, without a word. At eight hours, the voice of a service corps soldier attached to the cadet pilots made us jump. With our nerves on edge, we had only managed to doze rather than sleep. Order from the Commandant. Training will begin at 8.30 hours. After the night alert, we had expected to stay in bed till 10, but nobody made a murmur against the orders. Hurrying into our flying suits, we ran to the airstrip, where Flight Lieutenant Wuhara was waiting for us in front of a Kai-43. He said solemnly, From now on, the enemy may possibly attack every day. Your training in firing from the Kai-43 is therefore more urgent than ever. We must take advantage of every moment of respite from American raids. The Kai-43 was equipped with a reflector sight, which showed the correct point of aim once your adversary was in the sight. The pilot only had to glance at it, which meant that he could retain his normal position without having to move his head. He could also turn his eyes away and search the skies for other attackers while still keeping his aim. This was vastly superior to the telephoto sights on the Ki-27, which obliged the pilot to place his eye against the lens each time he aimed, thus giving him little chance to watch out for enemies. In spite of this advantage, accurate firing was still difficult. In all positions, the plane had a tendency to sideslip at the moment of firing. It was only very rarely that a pilot could fire whilst flying level. All the cadet pilots acknowledged the fact that the period of training allowed to us would be quite inadequate. It was undeniable. That evening in the mess, one of the officers told us about the raid on Tokyo and described its horrifying effects, taking off from airfields on the Marianas, Guam, Saipan and Tinian, and loaded with almost 2,000 tonnes of bombs. The B-29s had aimed for over three hours, not at military targets, but at the wood and paper houses of the densely crowded poorer districts of the city. This ensured the most efficient use of incendiaries, Unfortunately, our night fighters had been able to make only a feeble impact on the bombers, 14 shot down and 42 damaged. The poor quarters had been engulfed in flames within the blinking of an eye, and most of the inhabitants burned alive. Rough estimates gave the figures as 270,000 houses burned, 85,000 dead and 40,000 wounded. My God, exclaimed the officer, this must be the most gruesome spectacle ever witnessed. The streets are cluttered with charred corpses. Some of them died writhing in agony. You can see that from the positions of the bodies. It's a scene straight from hell. This savage raid shocked the nation beyond anything that had gone before. Two nights later, my hometown, Nagoya, was attacked by the B-29s. On March 13, it was the turn of Osaka, the second largest city in Japan. Incendiaries everywhere. Probably my home no longer existed. The air raids went on. They were not aimed at military targets, but designed to provoke panic amongst civilians. 
Ten days later, the American fighters invaded the skies over Kanto. We received no orders to sortie, so there we were, all the pilots of the 24th Squadron forced to remain earthbound, grinding our teeth in rage and frustration. The enemy aircraft flew imperturbably over our heads, no higher than 3,250 feet, 8, 10, 15 planes. At that moment, I saw six key 61s called darting swallows pursuing the enemy. A few seconds later, they went into the attack using aerobatic tactics. One plane caught fire just as it started to loop the loop. Was it an American or one of ours? It's one of ours, someone shouted. As it fell in flames, we glimpsed the rising sun painted on the fuselage. The pilot parachuted out. The white balloon unfurled itself against the blue sky. Even in these circumstances, the contrast between the two colours was poetic. But beneath this white semicircle, a human being was in mortal danger, and the thought wrung my heart. An enemy fighter circled round the parachute and fired several tracer bullets. He was machine-gunning his defenceless enemy. What cowardice! Was this an example of American chivalry? In my imagination, I pictured our pilot weeping before his head dropped forward abruptly. Our helplessness made my blood boil. Our experienced pilots perished one after another. Our army could not regain mastery of the air over the territories occupied by the Americans. Yet the outcome of the war in the Pacific depended solely on supremacy in the air. Exceptional means were needed to salvage the situation. The military high command proposed the mobilization of 1,900,000 men to aid in administration and improve supplies. Half the civilian motor cars and a number of horses would be commandeered. As well as this, it was hoped to organise an army of volunteers and a fighting force composed of men under 60 and women under 40, a total of some 28 million people. So my comrades Oshima and Suzuki would be called up, they would have to abandon their studies. I felt sorry for them. But how were these newly mobilised forces to be armed when we were already short of ammunition? Reserves had been still further reduced by the American raids and the shortage of manpower. The situation was so serious that coins were now being struck in clay. The projected manufacture of 1,700 airplanes remained a leitry. In these critical circumstances, the military high command was considering limiting our defences to the landing beaches on the Japanese archipelago. Our navy wanted to mount a decisive battle off the shores of Okinawa, using the 3,700 planes which were to be sent to them as reinforcements before the end of April. They judged that an engagement off Okinawa would be more effective. However, it would be nothing more than a diverting action to gain time. On March 16th, the battle for Iwo Jima, begun on February 25, was to end tragically. General Kuribayashi, in command of the island's garrison, sent his last message to Tokyo. We have exhausted our ammunition and the last drop of water. The survivors of this hard battle are about to make a last assault against the enemy. We give thanks for the blessings and favour of His Imperial Majesty, and we shall never regret sacrificing our lives for our country. The moment has come to say goodbye. On March 27, the general shot himself in the head. His men fought to the death. The defeat was a mortal blow, for the capture of this island enabled the long-range P-51 Mustang fighter to escort the B-29. The war was entering its last desperate phase. It was out of the question for Japan to surrender without a struggle. The essence of Bushido was to fight on until one's sword was broken and one's last arrow spent. How could we find a way out of this extremely difficult situation? Ideally, it would be better to prevent the enemy planes from invading our skies, rather than concentrate on shooting them down once they were there. But it would be impossible to wipe out all the B-29 airfields in the Marianas, since we had lost both air and sea supremacy. At least we could try to stop the American fighters taking off from the aircraft carriers. This was how we came to consider suicide attacks, since it was a matter of the utmost urgency to destroy the enemy carriers that dared to show themselves in our waters. But the use of this desperate means did not come about in a very direct manner. A tardy spring was now approaching, but far from rejoicing, we felt that death was hastening his footsteps towards us. Suicide attacks demanded technical skill of a very high order, and I had a feeling it was still too early for them to call on us to carry out such problematic missions. We were not sufficiently experienced, and the delays in our advanced training would prevent our inclusion in the suicide squads. 
Or was it that, at the bottom of my heart, I was really counting on that? In any case, this feeble hope, much to be deplored, gave way before my ardent desire to contribute to victory. I was torn by contradictions and railed at myself for faint-heartedness. The history of suicide attacks dates from October 1944. It was Takada, commandant of the 5th Army Squadron, who first attempted this kind of attack. He had deliberately crashed his plane on an enemy ship during the Battle of Biak Island at the end of May 1944. And in mid-October, Rear Admiral Arima's plane, damaged by bullets, had dived down in an effort to strike an American carrier during the Battle of Formosa. It fell into the sea close by without reaching the ship. However, the suicide attacks carried out by these two heroes were not preconceived and planned. It was October 20 that the first collective special attack squad was officially formed under the leadership of Naval Lieutenant Yukio Seki. Nowadays, even in Japan, pilots of this special attack force are usually called kamikaze, but during the war, their official name was Shimpu Tokubetsu Kogekitai, Special Attack Corps, in the Navy, and Shimbu Tokubetsu Kogekitat in the Army. The first Special Attack Corps was born in the Navy. At the end of July 1944, the first naval air fleet was formed under the command of Vice Admiral Terayoka. The previous one had been totally destroyed. On August 12th, when the Vice Admiral arrived at Davao, on the island of Mindanao in the Philippines, he had a total of about 300 aircraft at his disposal, including several transport and reconnaissance planes. After urgent demands to the high command, the number was increased to 500, but of these, only 280 were capable of effective action. On September 10, a sentry started a false alarm, amphibious enemy forces in sight. No one could believe his ears. The plane, which had made a 400-mile reconnaissance over the sea the day before, had reported nothing. Nevertheless, hundred fighters from Davao were hastily sent to the base at Cebu. The enemy's incessant patrols soon discovered our fighters massed on this small airfield, and they were not going to let such a marvellous chance pass by. Two days later, 160 planes attacked in several waves from 9 hours till 17 hours. Caught unprepared, almost all our fighters were destroyed, though they managed to bring down 10 of the enemy. And of course, losses from other attacks had to be taken into account also. In effect, the first naval air fleet possessed only 30 fighters when Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi, the new commander-in-chief, arrived on October 17. Air Force planes were divided into three categories, those which were capable of engaging in air battles, those which constituted a reserve, and those in need of repairs. A total of 30, therefore, meant only 10 actively available. In spite of his high-sounding title of Commander-in-Chief of the 1st Naval Air Fleet, the Vice Admiral commanded barely a squadron. Having directed the administration of aeronautical armaments, he was well aware that he had not the slightest hope of receiving additional planes. The 201st Fighter Squadron of the 1st Naval Air Fleet formed the 1st Suicide Attack Corps. It may be thought that this extraordinary procedure was born of despair, but it was not so. Pilots had long been deliberating on every possibility of destroying the task force with a limited number of fighters. The bomber squadrons were equally short of aircraft, but for a single bomber in production, five fighters could be made. It was therefore on the latter that our aircraft industry concentrated. The logical consequence was to attack the task force solely with fighters. The pilots hit on the idea of loading their zeros with one 550-pound bomb, of course, one could not hope to sink an aircraft carrier with a single bomb of this type, but at least it could put the ship out of action by rendering the flight deck unusable. It would mean literally wave hopping, skimming just above the water, then releasing the bomb in such a manner that it would hit the flight deck after bouncing off the surface of the sea. Various elements had to be calculated. The altitude from which the bomb was dropped, the speed of the aircraft and its distance from the target, the direction of the wind, effects of rough or calm surface, and so on. The 201st Squadron began a training that proved to be full of hazards. For example, a bomb released at an altitude of 13 feet rebounded to a height of 16 feet and the airplane passed under the bomb. After practicing at peril of their lives, the pilots concluded that it was necessary to drop the bomb from 30 feet and at a distance of 325 yards in order to reach the target. Another problem arose. 
how to avoid crashing the plane. The Zero fighter, with a top speed of 280 miles per hour, was in danger of crashing into the ship 2.4 seconds after dropping the bomb. No matter how skillful he was, the pilot had only one chance in a hundred of escaping, and anti-aircraft fire from the ships reduced this to 0.1%. Vice Admiral Onishi personally reduced this safety margin to zero. On October 18, he had an interview with Vice Admiral Terayoka, who was leaving the base. Normal tactics are no longer valid, said Terayoka. I agree with you entirely. If we really want to win, we must eschew all sensibility. I suggest we appeal directly to the pilots to carry out these suicide missions, rather than go through their squadron leaders. Crashing our fighters against the aircraft carriers seems to me our last chance. What do you think? All the same, I think it would be better to entrust the squadron leaders with this appeal to the men. Very well. We shall call this suicide attack corps Shimpu Tokubetsu Kogekitai. It will be divided into four groups, Shikishima, Beautiful Island, Yamato, the Japanese people, Asahi, Rising Run, and Yamazakura, Vertical Bar, Wild Cherry Blossom. These four names were suggested by an ancient Japanese poem. If you ask me what is the soul of the Japanese, the people of the beautiful island, I will tell you that it is the wild cherry blossom that scatters its perfume in the light of the rising sun. The blossom of the wild cherry, having scattered its perfume, falls without regrets. The meaning of this verse is that our people must always be ready to die for the benefit of their country, and like the blossom, they must fall without regrets. Next evening, Vice Admiral Onishi called five officers into a room in the headquarters of the 201st Squadron, which was based at Clark Field in the island of Luzon in the Philippines. Those present were Captain Inoguchi, Senior General Staff Officer of the 1st Air Fleet, Captain Tamai, second in command of the 201st Squadron, Naval Lieutenants Ibusuki and Yokoyama, who were senior pilots, and a staff officer of the 26th Squadron. He looked at them for a long time and then addressed them in a very grave tone. Kurita's fleet, he said, is absolutely compelled to make a stand in the Gulf of Leyte. We are charged with giving him air cover. We must knock out the flight decks of the enemy carriers for a week at least. In my opinion, the sole method of attack that could achieve this end is a suicide attack led by Zeros loaded with 550-pound bombs. What do you think? After a moment's silence, Tamai spoke. I am only the second in command, sir. Since it concerns the entire squadron, I feel I must seek the opinion of my superior, Captain Yamamoto, before giving an answer. I have already spoken to Yamamoto in Manila. You need have no hesitation in adopting his opinion. The truth of the matter was that Onishi had not yet discussed it with Yamamoto. His had indeed summoned him to Manila, but instead of waiting for his arrival, had impatiently taken off and flown to the 201st Squadron base. Having missed Onishi at Manila, Yamamoto set out to return to his base, but had to make a forced landing on the way. He was injured and taken to hospital. Everybody understood perfectly well Onishi's impatience and irritation. Indeed, they shared it, but there was a subtle difference between spontaneous suicide attacks and actually ordering men to sacrifice their lives. The circumspect Tamai, not knowing what to reply at once, asked the commandant for a few minutes to reflect and to discuss it with his comrades. When this was granted, he left the room with Ibusuki. The two men had an impassioned interview. They were concerned as to the effect this suicide order would have on the pilots. Their morale was high, but would they think such an order justified? Everything would be determined by the first attempt. If it succeeded and proved that a single fighter could effectively damage an aircraft carrier, then everyone would be willing to carry out similar missions. The order would vindicate itself. On the other hand, a failure would be disastrous. It would utterly demoralize the pilots. Captain Tamai called together the NCO pilots of the 9th intake. They had come under his command a year previously at the 263rd Squadron's airbase at Matsuyama in Shikoku and had shared with him in various battles from the Marianas to Yap. Two-thirds of them had been killed, and there were only 23 survivors. Tamai explained Onishi's proposal. In the gloomy room, lit by a single bulb, he saw their eyes shining with enthusiasm. The 23 pilots replied simply and without hesitation, Right, we agree, no problem. 
they were too young to express their feelings more articulately. Confronted with this burst of patriotic fervour, Tamai felt his eyes fill with tears. He went immediately to his commander's office to report his men's willing consent. All that remained was to choose their leader. They would have liked to propose Naval Lieutenant Sugano, an extremely brave officer who had distinguished himself during the Battle of the Yap Islands. Frustrated by the invulnerability of the B-24, he had rammed his plane into his foe and brought him down. Although half the wing was torn off his own plane, he had managed to return to base. He always kept his personal belongings in a little box labelled Property Left by the Late Captain Tadashi Sugano. He was bound to die heroically, and so merit the posthumous promotion. Unfortunately, at that moment, he was in Japan collecting extra planes, and it was Tamai himself who had ordered him to go. There were only about 15 officers left in the 201st Squadron. To whom should they entrust this difficult and important mission, which would demand the highest qualities of its leader? Honour, courage, outstanding ability, and absolute level-headedness. Tamai at once thought of Naval Lieutenant Yukio Seki. He had come from Formosa only one month before, so Tamai did not know him as well as he knew Sugano, but he knew that he was Sugano's equal from the point of view of patriotic devotion and skill as a pilot. It was one in the morning. Tamai sent a sailor to awaken Seki, then went to wait for him in the mess within Oguchi. A few minutes later, he heard Seki's step on the stairs. He turned his head towards the door where the lieutenant soon appeared. Present, sir, he said, standing at attention. Tamai invited him to sit beside him and tapped his shoulder before speaking. His throat was so constricted by emotion that he could barely get the words out. Understandably, he had difficulty restraining his tears. He had the exceedingly painful job of sending a 23-year-old officer to certain death, and Seki had just got married. After a long silence, Tamai explained to him the purpose of Vice Admiral Onishi's visit, then declared, and I have chosen you to lead the mission. Pale and tight-lipped, Seki remained silent, impassive, his elbows were resting on the table and he held his head in his hands. What was going through his mind at that moment? Was he thinking of his heavy responsibility or of his young wife? He was silent for so long, or so it seemed to Tamai and Inoguchi, that they began to wonder whether he would answer at all. In reality, it was only a few seconds later when he suddenly lifted his head and pushed the hair back from his forehead. His interlocutors tensed with anxiety. With shining eyes, Seki looked into their faces and said, I beg you to entrust me with this mission. There was no uncertainty in his voice. It expressed a firm resolution. Good, said Tamai simply, unable to find words to express the profound appreciation that flooded his whole being. Inoguchi, the general staff officer, left the mess hastily, as if afraid of showing his emotion. The unnatural pallor of Seki's face disturbed Tamai. After all, wasn't this young officer entitled to ask him why he had thus been condemned to death? The anxiety showed on his face and Seki guessed his feelings. Please don't worry, sir, he said almost joyfully. I have had diarrhoea for several days, that is why I look so pale. Tamai seemed relieved, as if he accepted the explanation. After leaving the mess precipitately, Captain Inoguchi knocked on Vice Admiral Onishi's office door, eager to make his report. The latter was lying on his camp bed, waiting impatiently. When Inoguchi entered, he sat up abruptly. The choice has been made, sir, said the captain. Lieutenant Seki, an ex-pupil of the Naval Academy. Onishi nodded his head. Good. He too seemed satisfied, though inwardly suffering anguish. The night of October 19-20 to passed slowly. The 24 pilots who had just been assigned to special attack missions and the commander-in-chief spent the night under the same roof for the first time. The vice-admiral could think of nothing but the tragic destiny that awaited these men. Conscious of the great weight of responsibility on his shoulders, he committed harakiri on August 16, 1945, after Japan had been defeated. There is a Japanese proverb which says, It is only after his death that one can estimate a man's true worth. Onishi himself often said, even when I am dead, people will hesitate to accord me my true worth. I shall never have a friend who understands me. 
It is certainly true that no one will ever know what passed that night in the hearts and minds of Onishi and his heroic men. The morning of October 20 was clear and fine. It was autumn, the season when man reaps what he has sown. For the 24 pilots of 201st Squadron, the fruits of their labour were their gruelling training and the sacrifice of their lives. Since dawn, they had been busily preparing for their mission. They were laughing, as if they had forgotten the dramatic resolution they had taken only a few hours before, and, to look at them, no one would have believed they were on the point of taking off on a mission from which they knew they would not return. After breakfast, the enemy task force showed no signs of putting in an appearance. Vice Admiral Onishi took advantage of this respite to harangue his men. A kind of moral dread had seized his soul, and for once he dropped his high rhetoric and spoke in a voice full of sorrow and affection. My sons, he said, who can raise our country from the desperate situation in which she finds herself? Not the ministers, not the political advisers to the throne, nor the naval chiefs of staff. Still less a humble commander-in-chief like myself. You alone, who have souls as pure as they are steadfast, you alone hold this power. That is why I have dared to ask you, in the name of 100 million Japanese, to carry out this mission. I hope with all my heart that you may be successful, that you... He could no longer find the words. At that solemn moment, the lightest word would have rung hollow. Onishi was trembling. At 15 hours, it was reported that the US task force was located to the east of the island of Samar. The suicide pilots wanted to take off without delay, but Onishi would not order a sortie yet. Look, he said, pointing to a naval map. The distance to the enemy's present position is exactly that of the Zero's range, so they would have little chance of catching up with the task force. I cannot permit their departure. This mission must succeed at first strike. It can't be repeated. A few minutes later, he left for Manila, where he hoped to persuade headquarters to defer Kurita's ships engaging with the task force until after the intervention of the Special Attack Corps. Unhappily, Kurita's second fleet had left their base two hours earlier and were already making for Leyte. That same morning, no sooner was he up than a certain naval ensign first-class Kuno noticed that an abnormal atmosphere pervaded the 201st Squadron's base. An ex-university student who had signed on at the Naval Flying School, he knew nothing of the formation of a Shimpu Corps. He received orders to leave for Cebu Airfield under the command of Naval Captain Nakajima, the senior pilot. Preoccupied with preparations for departure, he had not even been aware of Onishi's harangue. Before leaving, he anxiously inquired of Nakajima what was going on at the base, but the latter only replied brusquely, Nothing! The formation of eight zeros, led by Nakajima, left for Chibu at 17 hours. Four of these zeros belonged to the Yamato group. It had been decided to send them to Cebu and entrust Clark Field to three other groups. Being closer to the American carriers, Cebu was more exposed to danger, but it held one trump card. It was relatively difficult to spot from the air. On landing, Nakajima mustered his pilots and told them that a suicide attack corps had just been formed. Then he said, Others will want to follow in the footsteps of the first pilots charged with this mission. Volunteers should simply write their name and rank on a slip of paper and put it into an envelope. Those who do not wish to volunteer should submit a blank paper. The senior officer amongst you will bring me the envelopes before 2100 hours. No one but myself will know the outcome. I understand that each man has his personal reasons for his decision, and I assure you that those who do not accept this mission will never be blamed for lack of patriotism. As the envelopes were placed in front of him, Nakajima felt his heart beat faster. What would he do if everyone had handed in a blank? At the moment of slitting the envelopes, he felt a due sense of awe, for he understood the sacredness of the thing. He opened each one with care. Only two blank slips. The two pilots who had handed these in were both suffering from serious illnesses. He sighed with relief. At that moment, Ensign First Class Kuno came into his office. His eyes were bloodshot and he looked angry. Excuse me, sir, he said, hammering out his words, but I cannot understand how you can be so thoughtless as to exclude me from the suicide attack corps. Oh, but you haven't been excluded at all, replied Nakajima. You will be part of the group flying the Zeros we have just brought to Cebu. Kuno smiled. His whole expression cleared. 
he saluted and left the room, looking really happy. A few minutes later, Nakajima heard someone playing the piano. It must have been Kuno, for he was the only one at Cebu Airfield who could play it well. Now he was playing for the last time, and he put his whole soul into the music. Perhaps he was pouring out all his love for his wife. At 15 hours on the 21st, a message was received. Enemy aircraft carriers sighted 60 nautical miles to the east of Suluan Island. At that very moment, four zeros of the Yamato group, together with two escorting zeros, had just lined up on the runway. Several US Grummans appeared in the sky over the field. In the winking of an eye, six zeros were hit by bullets, though luckily their bomb loads did not explode and they were too badly damaged to fly. If only we could follow the Grummans, we would be able to locate the enemy aircraft carriers exactly, which we had not so far been able to do, owing to the shortage of reconnaissance planes. Nakajima instantly ordered the preparation of the reserve aircraft. Ten minutes later, three more zeros were ready. Kuno was in one of these. Nakajima said to him, You have no protective escort planes. If you cannot fulfill the mission, do not hesitate to turn back. Don't worry, replied Kuno. I shall certainly find some worthwhile targets at Leyte. That night, two zeros came back, having failed to locate the carriers. Kuno's zero did not return. According to an American communique, no aircraft carriers were damaged that day. At Clark Field, the Shizkishima Group, commanded by Lieutenant Seki, was on constant readiness for a suicide mission. On that same day, at 19 hours, the message came in. Enemy carriers sighted east of Leyte. Seki took off at the head of his flight of zeros, after having consigned to Tamai's care a paper in which he had wrapped a lock of his hair. However, all the zeros were obliged to return to base without having been able to find the US task force. The Shikishima group made sorties on each of the three days that followed, but had to return frustrated every time. On the 24th, the battleship Musashi had the misfortune to be sent to the bottom. Feeling that this was due to his failure to sight and destroy the enemy aircraft carriers, Seki bowed low before Tamai and said, I have no excuses. Tamai saw tears streaming down his cheeks. At 7.25 hours on the 25th, the Shkishtma group, bowl composed of five bomb-loaded fighters and four escorting zeros, left Clark Field. At 10.40, the lieutenant's formation chanced upon some American aircraft carriers about 8.50 nautical miles off the island of Leyte. Seki waggled his wings as a signal to attack, dived and skimmed just above the waves towards one of the carriers. Before the ship could begin evasive manoeuvres or the anti-aircraft guns could open fire, he had crashed into the carrier, exactly between the flight deck and the hull. The bomb he was carrying exploded, making a huge hole in the side of the ship. Another zero followed Seki, and with consummate skill plunged into the hole already ripped open in the ship's side. The carrier fled, zigzagging as it went. Pilots in the other zeros saw flames and black smoke billowing to a height of 3,000 feet. Another zero crashed into a second carrier and set it on fire. Yet another hit a heavy cruiser, which belched smoke and was presently shaken by secondary explosions. The Shikishima group had finally carried out their suicide mission, a horrifying spectacle, but at the same time a historic event. The heroes of this first suicide group had undoubtedly kept their eyes wide open right up to the fatal moment of the crash, as if they wanted to watch their own lives vanish forever. This took place early in the afternoon. The airmen at Cebu Field saw a Zero approaching at top speed. Sometimes, damaged planes from other squadrons arrived unannounced in this manner. The base was famous for giving strangers a warm welcome, and all comers would be regaled with sushi. As a result, some pilots made forced landings at Cebu just for the pleasure of indulging themselves with a plate of sushi. Thinking the Zero pilot must be one of these ravenous visitors, nobody paid any particular attention. The pilot made rather a wild landing and jumped out of his cockpit. He ran towards the commander's briefing room yelling, The Shikishima group have done it at last! He was the pilot of one of the escorting Zeros. He gave Captain Nakajima a detailed account of the show put on by the heroic flyers. It was a tale to make one's hair stand on end. Nakajima immediately sent a message to headquarter. 
The Shikishima group of the Shimpu Special Attack Corps have carried out a successful surprise attack on an enemy task force composed of four aircraft carriers, 30 sea miles northeast of Suluan Island. Two planes crashed into a carrier, which must certainly have sunk. The third started a fire on board a second carrier, and the last plane crashed into and sank a heavy cruiser. When Vice Admiral Onishi received this message, he was in conversation with Vice Admiral Fukudome, Commander-in-Chief of the 2nd Naval Air Fleet. They were speaking of this very mission. The 2nd Naval Air Fleet, possessing 500 planes, including reserves, arrived at Clark Field on the 23rd October. At a conference, Onishi proposed to Fukudome that he should form a special attack corps within his own body of men, but the latter refused. As I have already explained, missions of this nature demanded highly trained pilots. Normally, three years training at a field base and five years on carriers would be considered necessary, and the naval air fleet pilots had nowhere near this amount of experience. This was why Fukudome was against Onishi's proposal, although the two admirals continued to discuss the subject. In 1951, I happened to meet Vice Admiral Fukudome entirely by chance. I was acting as interpreter for a French journalist who was interviewing him. I took advantage of this to question him regarding the suicide attack groups in his own naval air fleet. I remember his replies exactly. At that period, he said to me affably, I was sharing a room in the headquarters of 201st Squadron with Vice Admiral Onishi. He kept repeating that there was no other mode of action still open to us and urged me to form similar corps in the naval air fleet, which by then was non-existent except on paper. Having no aircraft carriers left, we were perforce land-based. But the fact was, my pilots were terribly inexperienced. En route for Clark Field, we attacked the US task force off the coast of Formosa, and some of my pilots mistook dolphins for enemy subs. Others could not tell the difference between cruisers and destroyers. As an ex-kamikaze yourself, you will appreciate that this inexperience was an obstacle to the carrying out of such a difficult mission. On the 24th and 25th of October, we attacked the task force with all the means at our disposal. Result? Two cruisers and three destroyers damaged. Need I say more? On the other hand, on the 25th, the Shikishima group carried off a brilliant success, sinking two ships, including the aircraft carrier St. Lo. I spent the night of the 25th to 26th arguing with Onishi, and finally promised him the support of all my zeros. At dawn, I interrogated my staff officers. Some said this was now the only possible form of attack. Others insisted we should try one more large-scale conventional attack. However, it had been drizzling since morning, and in these conditions it would have been difficult to maintain flying formations. It was therefore circumstances that constrained me to take the final decision. I opted for special suicide missions. The Emperor was immediately informed of the heroic, unprecedented death of these young pilots. Then the news was given to the nation. Three days after the success of the first suicide attack, the words addressed by the Emperor to the Naval Chief of General Staff were transmitted to the frontline bases. Nakajima, pilot-in-chief of the 201st Squadron, assembled all pilots and mechanics and read them the message. Mounted on a little rostrum, he paused, then swallowed hard before speaking. I am going to read you the Emperor's words, he said in a voice full of emotion. Here they are, to think that it has come to this, and yet they have done nobly. Emotion nailed each man to the spot, deathly silence. Everyone was thinking of what the Emperor must have felt in his heart when he heard this great news, and of the suffering that had shown in his face. With aching heart, he had graciously praised them, but wasn't his true feeling one of despair? When Vice Admiral Onishi read the message, he seemed to be seized with both respect and fear. He was conscious that his action, his decision as a leader, fully merited the criticism implicit in the Emperor's words. On October 28, Admiral Toyoda, Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet, presented a citation to the Shikishima pilots, and on November 12, their illustrious deeds earned them a promotion. Thus, our aeronautical operation metamorphosed into a suicide mission. After the Navy, the Army adopted the same tactic. It was in the Philippines that the 4th Air Force, under the command of General Tominaga, organized its first special attack corps, Banda. During the Battle of the Philippines, the Army lost 658 men on suicide missions. 
The Navy invented this method by following through an irrefutable piece of logic. There was nothing else left to try. We ordinary pilots, more or less experienced, suffered the vague presentiment that sooner or later we would receive orders to carry out suicide missions. But we did not talk about it. Even when he is rushing towards disaster, man cherishes the insane hope that somehow he will survive. He comforts himself with the conviction that he will be the very last to fall victim to the tragedy. March 31st, 1945. For some days now, the airmen had enjoyed walking up and down the avenue of cherry trees that joined the barracks to the large bathhouse. They were impatient to see the buds bursting forth, but this year spring was late. It was as if she was teasing us, deliberately withholding her favours. One evening I walked there in the twilight, then I went to have a bath. As I entered our billet afterwards, someone said to me, Hey, orders to muster at 2030, in the CO's office. With his hands clasped behind his back, Commandant Swinaga walked up and down in front of the 24 pilots, standing at attention. All the first flight were present, and half the second. The CO's pale, tense face betrayed his agitation. The air was charged with anxiety. Suddenly, Swinaga stopped and looked at us one after the other. His gaze, gentle enough as a rule, seemed to transfix each man. As you know, he said at last in a grave voice, the army is short of pilots, petrol, planes and ammunition. In fact, everything. We find ourselves at an impasse. There is just one last resort left to us, to crash on the decks of enemy aircraft carriers, as your comrades have done before you. Two hours ago, our squadron received the order to form a special attack corps. I am compelled to ask you. He hesitated. But there was no need for him to go on. We knew at once that we were already committed. Of course I had been expecting it, and yet when I heard to crash on the decks of enemy aircraft carriers, I could not prevent myself from shivering, as if I had been slapped in the face. These words struck me to the heart. My legs trembled, I could scarcely breathe. After a silence, the commander-in-chief went on, to, to undertake this mission. It was an effort for him to bring out this phrase, which he hastily corrected. But of course you are free to choose, I will give you twenty-four hours to think it over. You will give me your answer tomorrow before twenty hundred hours. You may present yourselves individually at my office. The words came out all in a rush. Perhaps he wanted to get this delicate subject off his chest once and for all. His face was contorted with emotion. He had said a task you and not order you. Now, in the army, a superior officer never asked. He simply ordered. This was truly exceptional. But then even the most heartless officer would find it hard to ask his men to die. Military history teems with situations in which there was only a 10% chance of survival, but one that left no possible chance at all was unique. It was really Swenniger's duty to order us, and he knew it. His distress was beyond anything imaginable. Well, now, he wound up, the squadron still needs pilots to fight off enemy planes that invade our skies. This will be the task of the second half of the second flight and the whole of the third. I made my choice without ulterior motive, simply by numerical order. Dismiss. During the hour that remained before curfew, no one made any allusion to the CO's instructions. All the same, we did not appear downcast. We chatted, laughed, put our personal belongings in order, just as usual. However, once we were in bed, I could tell that everyone was restless. Men were tossing and turning in their beds. It was impossible to execute this highly skillful mission without special training, and the training could not last less than one month. One month to live. This thought delivered me from the obsessive idea of death. Human frailty makes us avoid looking death in the face. I said to myself, for the moment sleep. Afterwards, your new life will begin, a life that leads directly to death. But at this moment, your head is full of a thousand muddled reflections. They make no sense, so forget it. Think about it later, at your leisure. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, I began to worry about my right leg. It was still a little swollen, and I imagined my plane veering away just at the critical moment as I was diving towards the target, because I had not been able to press the rudder pedal with my right foot. Upset, I tried to chase away this nightmare. Then I started counting, a habitual remedy for sleeplessness since I was a child. Eight thousand, nine thousand, I do not know how many I counted. Sleep engulfed me like a deep chasm. April 1st. 
I bookichived to the first flight. My fellow cadet pilots were, like me, willing to accept the commander's request. Perhaps we were influenced by the already tense and highly charged atmosphere of the base. In any case, deep down, we had been expecting it. Yet at the bottom of our hearts, a vacillation, a reluctance of our whole beings, persisted. The CO had given us a free choice, not a categoric order. But in the army, did an underling really have any choice but to say, yes sir, certainly sir, to a superior officer? To obey orders and carry them out uncomplainingly is the fundamental duty of a soldier towards himself and towards the army. Therein lies the army's greatness and glory, as well as its inhumanity and ruthlessness. What would happen if soldiers refused to obey their officers? For us, the question was something else. Brothers have no need to ask one another to sacrifice their lives for the common defence. The security, the very existence of our families was threatened. Women, children and old men had already been among the innumerable and pathetic victims of bombing and machine gun fire. It was therefore natural that we should go to any lengths, regardless of our own safety, to protect our families. In a certain sense, our desire and the Commandant's request coincided. Referring to the circumstances in which our pilots joined the suicide squads, it is often asked, were they really volunteers or acting on official orders? I have no intention of glorifying this event, unique in the history of war, but as a witness who survived, I can affirm that our own wishes were in perfect accord with orders from the High Command. It was so in my own case, at any rate, and presumably in the case of Lieutenant Seki. On the evidence, whole groups of aviators presented themselves for these missions, under pressure of urgent circumstances. On the other hand, no one but the man himself can claim to know the state of his soul. Regrettably, there are intellectual hypocrites in Japan today who make this claim and indulge in censure of the kamikaze. The author of Chiran, for example, writes, If Lieutenant Seki reflected for a long time before replying, perhaps it was because he was devoured by anguish. Is it not true to say that under the circumstances, it was not so much a voluntary act as a compulsory one? In the majority of cases, these pilots were forced volunteers. Many veteran soldiers believe that the Suicide Corps represented the flower of the Japanese race, and that this worthy act was in the true tradition of our people. Volunteers or conscripts? That is not the question. I can only reaffirm that all my comrades were ready to accept the order voluntarily, even to ask to be sent on a suicide mission. It matters little whether they volunteered or acted under strict orders. Their one thought was to defend their homeland, even at the sacrifice of their lives. We ate our breakfast in the mess. Suddenly, cadet pilot Tanaka spoke up. Look, we're all ready to accept this mission. Why don't we go to the CO straight away and tell him so? Everyone agreed. Right. We were already on our feet when someone said by way of a joke, we might as well finish our breakfast at least. We all sat down again. I took advantage of this delay to bring up a detail. Our planes will carry a 500 to 550 pound bomb, so we shall have to make them lighter by stripping off the machine guns. And now we're so short of planes, we will not be given escort fighters as the other special attack groups were. How then can we give the American fighters the slip and get through to our targets? We must think about this. Think about what? shouted Tanaka. You're an excellent pilot. What are you afraid of? Don't you want to accept the mission? Don't you believe it can succeed? He looked at me sternly, leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs. A graduate of a Buddhist university in Kyoto, his character was cool and well-balanced. Yet at that moment I sensed some change in him. He seemed tense. I had never seen him so worked up before. You pour scorn on what I say, I replied, but my point is precisely this. Suicide attacks are the only method left to us, and therefore they must succeed. If, with our 24 planes, we can sink eight or nine enemy carriers, it will give time for the pilots who follow us to undergo full training. I am always ready to give up my life for the defence of Japan, but surely it is worth considering the best means of reaching the target. If we fail, if we allow ourselves to be shot down by Akak or American fighters, our sacrifice will serve no purpose. By the way, one of the cadets said suddenly, during the last month I have noticed that my eyesight is failing. I cannot see the target clearly. I am doubtful about taking part in this attack. Theoretically, the first man to spot the enemy wins the battle, I said. 
but this mission does not necessarily demand such good eyesight, since our target will not be a plane but a huge aircraft carrier. All you have to do is follow the plane in front of you. Crashing won't be difficult. Nagatsuka's right up to a point, said Tanaka, but I still think poor eyesight is fatal to a pilot. How will you be able to evade attacking fighters? I advise you to tell the CO the truth and let him decide what you should do. Have you consulted the MO? Not yet, replied the cadet. I didn't dare in case he grounded me. I want to be a pilot right up to the end, you understand? He let out a deep sigh, full of sorrow, and lowered his eyes. His face expressed a profound bitterness. Suddenly, he put down his chopsticks, stood up and walked over to the window. After a few moments, he turned round, making a little woebegone gesture. Well, it can't be helped, he said. I'll tell the Commandant the truth about my eyes. I hope he'll let me stay with you. That is my one wish. Flying Officer Enomoto came into the mess. He was our senior, a Tokuso of the first intake. He had studied Japanese history at Hiroshima High School. We stood up and saluted him. He returned the salute, then sat down with us. He looked intensely worried. Mastering himself with an effort, he said, You've decided, eh? Haven't we intellectuals a duty to fulfil after the defeat? Life too has its value. I thought it over last night. So, said someone sarcastically, you're convinced that Japan will be defeated? Yes and no. I have a distinct foreboding, but I can't answer that question clearly. The military high command doesn't always keep us informed of the real state of the war. But in life, it's no use giving in to despair. One must try to find a solution. No man wants his country to be vanquished. The government and the fighting forces have to take responsibility in this crisis. The civilians are in no way responsible, yet they are exposed to the risk of death. It is our duty as pilots to protect them at all costs. My personal life counts for nothing in comparison with the well-being of our people. I am going to say yes to the Commandant. Sir, said Tanaka, we have all come to the same conclusion. Victory or defeat, that is no longer the question. Other suicide pilots will follow us. This special mode of attack and the number of carriers we manage to sink cannot fail to impress the Americans. Even if these missions cannot ensure our victory, they will at least put us in an honourable position to negotiate an eventual armistice. We are ready to go to the commanding officer with you. He looked round at his comrades. No one made any objections. We hastily gulped down our breakfast. Then, led by Enomoto, we went to Suenaga's office. Sir, said Enomoto, on behalf of these six cadet pilots of the first flight and myself, I request the favour of being sent on a special attack mission. Thank you, said the CO simply. Then, with his hands behind his back, he went and gazed out over the vast view from the window. Perhaps he did not want us to see that his eyes were misty with tears. Really? he went on in an emotional voice, without turning round. I cannot find words to thank you. You are students, not professional airmen. Your steadfastness and courage overwhelm me. Apart from one NCO in the second flight who is ill, every one of you has volunteered. From this moment, special training will begin. Flight Lieutenant Takagui will be in charge of you. We walked out of the office, leaving behind the pilot who had complained of his eyesight. At 9.30 hours, just as we were about to start training, the air raid warning sounded. The B-29s had reportedly left their base, though their objective was not yet clear. In any case, the possibility of a raid prevented our taking off. That same evening, our group was officially named Kskusui Group of the Jonno Special Attack Corps. Kikusui denotes chrysanthemums floating on a river and Jonno the sacrifice to the emperor. In all, we were 22 pilots. The unlucky cadet who had been suffering from poor eyesight was rejected on these grounds, in spite of his eagerness to join. Inevitably, he was transferred to the non-flying personnel. His sorrow was apparent, whereas we, who were destined to die in a month or so, were full of high spirits. April 2nd, 1945. In theory, our training would be completed in 30 days. However, delays due to shortage of fuel and to American raids meant it could last as long as two months. We were therefore given priority to the detriment of other pilots. At 7.30 hours, the order to begin training was given. Flight Lieutenant Takagui spoke solemnly to the 22 pilots gathered under the awning over the briefing room. I am in command of the Kikusui group. Training will begin with takeoff practice. 
Later, we shall go on to simulated attacking dives with a ship as target. This awning will act as the target. At an altitude of 16 feet, you will elevate the nose of the plane. Above all, do not shut your eyes at the last moment. That is absolutely vital. I'm going to give you a demonstration. Taka Gui was 23 years old and a graduate of the Army Flying School. Very keen, with sparkling eyes, he sometimes gave the ground crews a rocket. Everyone was afraid of him, but he never ill-treated the pilots. It was said that he had shot down more than 15 enemy aircraft during the Battle of the West Pacific. Tall and robust, he reminded us of a bronze statue. His face was rather inexpressive, and he never smiled. In short, he was the very personification of the fanatical and short-sighted professional serviceman. But the thought that I was soon to share his fate, whether I liked it or not, made me look at him in a rather more sympathetic light. There is a tendency to think that suicide attacks were simply a matter of crashing blindly and heedlessly into the target. As I have already said, it was not as easy as that. Taking off, for example, required the utmost caution. With a bomb weighing over 500 pounds, the Kai-43 would stall if pulled up off the ground in the usual way, so our first day was devoted to take-off drill. A log weighing about 200 pounds was fastened under the planes in lieu of a bomb. Needing a longer runway than the Ki-45 Kai, we had to bring the nose up right at the end of the airstrip, at the level of the trees that bordered the field. It was impressive to see the branches, from close to, bending in the wind produced by the plane. The undercarriage could not be retracted until we had gained sufficient speed at a height of about 150 feet. An hour later, takeoff practice ended. We had to economize on fuel. The Azkusu's group was composed of eight NCOs, ten cadet pilots, and three junior officers, originally in the infantry who had become pilots. There was a certain amount of implicit rivalry among the various pilots. But oddly enough, once training began, a mutual sympathy drew them together. No doubt it was a sense of solidarity in face of a common destiny, as when all the rams in a flock close ranks in self-defense. That evening, in the mess, Flight Lieutenant Wahara explained a suicide attack to us in detail. You haven't read the papers for a long time, he said, so you haven't heard about the success of the second Mitate group off Iwo Jima, Twenty suicide planes heroically attacked the American ships escorting the troops who landed there on the 21st of February. Three suicide planes crashed one after the other into the aircraft carrier Saratoga, hurling themselves at the same point on the deck. She was forced to withdraw, badly damaged, and with more than 200 dead and wounded. Another suicide plane hit the escorting carrier, the Bismarck Sea, which sank after the crash had set off a number of explosions. Another escorting carrier and two transport ships were struck by other suicide planes and suffered considerable damage. Our attack sowed terror amongst the enemy sailors, proving that this method has a certain psychological value. At the same time, it must be admitted that half our suicide planes were caught by Akak as they dived and fell into the sea without reaching their objectives. Some, it is said, were hampered by jets of water thrown up by shells. The enemy have invented a new tactic, they explode shells all round their own ships so as to create a screen of water spouts. Whatever you do, don't lose your heads. Keep calm. If you are shot down during your crash dive, you will die in vain. In the case of a water skimming approach, you run the risk of being caught in the water spouts, as well as by the ACAC. If you use the high altitude approach, enemy fighters may shoot you down. Success is either way problematic. It is up to you to decide by calmly calculating all the factors of the actual conditions present, whether to use the wave hopping or the high altitude approach. We realized how difficult our task was. Failure would be irredeemable, since the price of a single attack would be our lives. Moreover, it was not expedient for five or six suicide planes to hurl themselves at the same ship. One plane against one ship. That was the basic principle. Wahara's lecture gave me much food for thought. April 4th. After takeoff training, we tried the high altitude approach for the first time. Today, April 4th, was the fourth day of the fourth month of the year. Four is pronounced sha, and so is the word meaning death. I am not superstitious, but I could not prevent myself from reading omens everywhere. This training would lead me to my death in the very near future. For the light fighters, two methods of approach had been developed the high and the very low altitude. 
The former had the advantage of making interception by enemy fighters difficult. It consisted in concealing oneself amongst the clouds till the last possible moment, then starting the dive from 16,000 to 20,000 feet. At the end of the trajectory, the nose of the plane had to be pulled up to an angle of 45 to 55 degrees in relation to the point aimed at. There could be only one attempt at this approach. In practice, I did not dive steeply enough at the beginning of the descent, and so passed high over the awning, which was supposed to be the aircraft carrier, instead of almost skimming it. Total failure. This brought home to me the realities of the problem. Before dismissing us, Flight Lieutenant Takagui, still wooden-faced, said to us, In the case of the high-altitude approach, you should aim at the lift cages at the bow or the stern of the carriers. They present the weakest spot. Ideally, one should plunge down the funnel. It's the best way to sink a ship in the twinkling of an eye. But good God, if the experiment you just carried out had been real, you would all have fallen into the sea without striking your target. So we must go back and spend some time practicing takeoff and getting into formation with the minimum possible delay. Circling about over the airfield only wastes fuel. On April 1st, the Americans landed on Okinawa, an island that forms part of metropolitan Japan. Our navy was to mount a decisive battle in this zone. Perhaps large numbers of suicide planes would be used in an effort to destroy the 5th US fleet. Some of the officers in our squadron were hoping that the special attack corps of remarkable success would put an end to hostilities. The Battle of Okinawa marked a turning point in the destiny of Japan.